Hi everyone, uh, we'll be starting the webinar right now. So uh, let's uh, do some simple int introductions. So basically, um, uh, my name is Steffi. I'm actually part of Inky Learning. And I'll be bringing you through uh, some, some uh, facts about us. Uh. So basically, we are actually um, a group of uh, graduated students who are actually uh, working towards, you know, uh, giving um, accessible help to uh, secondary school to JC students. And um, this, web this webinar is actually part of that effort. So um, moving on, uh, I'll let actually uh, our tutor today, um, Lizard, as he would like to be um, known uh, to you guys, uh, carry on with his uh, lesson. So hope you guys enjoyed this session and uh, remember to uh, fill up the feedback form which I sent to, to you all over the email uh, at the end of this session. Thank you so much. All right. So, hey, everyone. Hope you guys have a great week and you have been enjoying your Saturday thus far. So, yeah, uh, thank you, Steffi, for the introduction on Inky. So before I actually start my webinar, I'd like to give, out, give a shout out to a friend of mine. So they are called YXY Piano Covers. The music that I've heard just now in the pre-webinar is basically all the songs that he played on the piano mainly anime songs, although you do occasionally see some uh, Chinese songs as well. So do check out his YouTube channel, YXY Piano Covers slash Nayu, or follow him on Instagram at IG at YXY Piano Covers. Or if you are into Discord, do join his Discord, right? Yeah, do do shower him with, with your love, man. He really deserves it a lot, all right? So yeah, more about me. Uh, I'm an expiring teenager. I graduated in 2019. And as you can see, my lovely plushies right there, a uh, snowball stitch and pinky, and I'm hugging stitch right now so because I need that uh, comfort right now. And in the most serious note, I studied H2 for the math and H2 math in JC, and I was offered to do math and stats it at uh, Imperial College in 2022, which is next year. And I also have my YouTube channel, which I just started out this year. It's, again, a small lizard. And you can follow me on my Instagram. If you want to look at the progress or just on my uh, bloopers, uh, yeah, you can follow, check it out as well, all right? So why I decided to do alternative methods instead of, let's say, covering content? Because sometimes the alternative methods, right, they're actually more efficient or intuitive, and they have a relevant and higher frequency of usage, right? And these methods mainly come from the further math syllabus. And the topics that I'll cover today are these topics, the pure side, sequence and series, differentiation, integration, and complex numbers. There's actually another method as well, but it's for the statistics portion. It's the normal distribution itself. And yeah, I, I don't have time to do it uh, these, uh, this today, but I will um, do it uh, another, another time. Maybe the earliest is two weeks from now, all right? And there's actually another method. It's for differential equations. Uh, I wanted to kind of teach it, but I figured that um, the method doesn't really it's not very, exactly very useful because you only use it to check your answer, all right? So I won't be going through the differential equations, although I'll probably put it as a FYI in like future webinars or in some of the resources that we'll be putting out in the Inkey Learning Discord channel. So without further ado, let's start with the first chapter, sequences and series. The ex we will examine the usage of recurrence relations. So we have this question. A patient administered a 500 milligram dose of drug A every six hours, and at the end of each six-hour period, 32% of the amount of drug present at the start of the six hour period remains. So one thing you know about this question is that it is a combination of a geometric progression, you have 32%, and then at the end of the six hour period, which is basically the start of the next six hour period, you add another 500 milligram dose. So you then have another 500 milligram after every six hours. So it's kind of a combination between our geometric progression and our arithmetic progression, and therefore, what you might do is, if you look at part I, is basically finding the number of drug, amount of drug after inside the patient after the third dose. So we let, again, sequence and series, define your variables, define your functions. In this case, you'll use, well, for sequence and series, something that is special is U subscript N. So you let UN be the amount of drug in milligram present immediately after the patient takes the nth dose. Basically, just copying down the question in part I, right? That's how you should actually define your functions as well. So you just whack the values in. So you have U2 equals to 32% of the previous dose, which is 500 milligrams, plus another 500 to give you 660. Then you do the same thing for U3. Therefore, at the third dose, you see that you have 711.2 milligrams of uh, the drug in the patient. Then in part two, right, 
it's saying that there's an overdose when the drug A exceeds 735 milligrams, and they ask you to calculate the maximum number of doses before the patient overdoses. So usually what you do is you want to find a general equation because I don't think it's very wise to try to keep on going, right? You don't want to go U4, U5, U6, because who knows? If the answer is actually U30, then uh, good luck to you. you don't, you're not going to waste your time putting 4, 5, 6, all the way to 30. So you will definitely do a general formula. So you do some pattern recognition. So you take some values previously, your U2, your U3, and your U4. And what you start to notice is for this type of questions, there's this kind of a pattern that you will definitely see. So if you look at U3, you don't expand everything. You notice that it's kind of like a geometric progression, right? With the first term 500, the common ratio 0 0.32. You notice that this whole equation here, so let's say I take this here, it's three terms of the geometric progression. And then you notice out here, it's four terms, right? So you have three terms and four terms with your A being 500 and R being 0 0.32. Now, here's the thing. All right, I will look at it. I want you guys to look at it in another way because this is not generally true for all our sequences and series when it comes to this type of questions. In fact, I will only look at the last two terms here and for this one, the last three terms. So we don't include the first term. And you start to see a pattern where you notice that on the right, you still have the geometric progression with two terms for U3 and three terms for U4. So we have two and three. If you look at the First term here is 0 0.32 square times 500. The next one is 0 0.32 cubed times 500. And you notice there's some of a pattern for the first term. It's basically the general term for our geometric progression, right? So basically un equals to a r n minus one. So that is the idea. So over here, right, for our first term, you notice that there's a 500, which stays throughout u2, uh, u3 and u4, and then the power increases from two to three. So when you're, when, when you're finding patterns in our sequences and series, always compare it to the term that you're looking at. So in this case, you have term number three. You notice that the power is two and the number of terms is also two. If you have U4, the power is three and there are three terms. So if I were to craft a formula for UN, you notice that it's simply 0.32 power N minus one. Right, because the power is one less than the actual term. So if my term is un, my, my power will be n minus one times 500. Then on the right, it's basically the geometric progression, which is the summation of it, with first term 500, common ratio 0 0.32, and there are n minus one terms. Right, Basically, the number of terms corresponds to the power of the first term. That will give us the formula for the summation of a geometric progression, a times one minus r to power of number of terms over one minus zero point three two. This will be your, then your, this you get this equation as our general formula, and then normally you just solve it algebraically or you not know, you just take your table of values. So this is the OG method, right? The H two method that they teach you, but it's kind of tedious, right? For me, it's very tedious because there's a lot more steps that you need than you take. So the method that I'm going to show you guys is the idea that you notice that the UN the amount of u, the value of un kind of like relates to the value for the previous term. How so? We have 32% of the amount of drug present at the start. That means it will be the previous term. So at the start of the six hour period, we can equate this as un minus one, which means that we have un equals to 0 0.32 of un minus one. Then afterwards, we add the 500 because after the first dose, after the six hours, you have to take the 500. So you then add back the 500. Because the question didn't want you to find UN, you can actually stop here. But I'll show you the expansion because you need it for the next question. So from here, right, what you do is continue expanding. So we substitute UN minus one with the same idea. So UN minus one equals to 0 0.32 of UN minus two plus 500. Then you add the 500 outside. Then you just basically expand, so you get 0 0.32 square, un minus 2 plus 0 0.32 of 500 plus another 500. So it's the same pattern as before. You notice that on the right, you have a geometric progression, first term 500, common ratio 0 0.32. On the left, same thing as just now, 
for the first term, power is 2 and the ratio is 0 0.32. So the difference is, instead of comparing to the term itself, as what you did for the previous, the earlier method, you now compare it to the term that you're multiplying with. So you look at the n minus 2 side. So what you notice is that this power here plus n minus 2 would always equals to n. If you notice for our first statement, this is power 1, here is n minus 1. So the idea is that n minus 1 plus the power would equals to n. And if you don't believe me, I can expand this even further. And you'll get 0 0.32 cubed un minus 3 plus 0 0.32 cubed, sorry, a square, 500 plus 0 0.32, 500 plus another 500. Okay, so you notice n minus 3 here, I get 3 here, they add together, will always give you n. On the right, it's the same idea. The number of terms correspond to the power. So here you have power 2. Here you have, ah, I can't draw. Here you have two terms. Here, power 3, therefore three terms. So we can't already get the formula, so we can then skip to the end. Now the question is, you notice that you're always decreasing the term, right? un minus 1 to un minus 2 to un minus 3. Eventually you have to stop, right? So where should we stop? Now, you look at how you define your un. Un is basically the amount of drug present immediately after the nth dose. So if you think about it, you have the first dose, right? You have U1 because U1 is basically the amount the patient took after the first dose, which is 500. Alternatively, you have U0 because if the patient doesn't take any dose, it will be zero grams, all right? I'm, let me just get back some people. I'm meeting some people that are just streaming in. All right. Okay, yes, give me a moment. Some people are still coming in. All right, fantastic. So as back to our saying, so you have U0 and U1. Now these terms, right, they actually kind of call your initial conditions. But we have two probable conditions. It actually doesn't matter which one you pick because both are correct, right? You don't take any dose, should have any drug inside of you. If you take the first dose, well, the amount of drug inside of you would be the first dose itself. As such, right, if you can either expand it to U1 or U0. So for me, I'll choose U0 because U0 equals 0. But for the purpose of uh, illustration, I'll use U1. So I have U1. So applying the same pattern, the power plus the term, the number, the term number would equals to n. So here will be n minus one. The power corresponds to the number of terms in our geometric progression. Therefore, we have the summation of a geometric progression of n minus one terms. So 500 times one minus 0 0.32 to the power of the number of terms, which is n minus one over 0 0.68, which is pretty much 1 minus 0 0.32. All right, there you get the equation at the end. All right, of course, substituting u1 as 500. All right, so this is one way to do it. And whatever the way it is, right, you can then put it at your graph, or you can have sequence mode on, you can put it into your sequence, and then you get these table of values. So I use the y1 graph, and then I open my table to get these table of values. All right. Now, here's the thing. If you look at the question, they didn't really ask you to actually find UN itself. They didn't ask you to find the general formula. So what you can do is, you can actually solve the question with just one step. Right? We know that UN equals to 0 0.32 of UN minus 1 plus 500. Right? You can just key into your GC immediately. So if, if you have the new GC, you go to our sequence mode, you can either go to sequence N or sequence N plus 1, but with the new GC, you have sequence n plus 1. So what you just need to do is 0.32 un plus 500. Now, basically, the idea is that you need an initial condition. So over here, we have u1. So basically, just calculate what u1 is. We know that u1 is 500, basically the first dose. So you just type in 500 here, press enter. You, get, you immediately get the table of values. And then you can solve the question already. All right. If you're using the OGC or if you're using sequence n, you have to type u bracket n minus 1, close bracket, plus 500. Then again, u n min basically means the first term. So if your n min is defined as the first term, if it's 1, so we have u1 as our first term. Again, here is 500. If I change this 1 to 0, then it will be 0. 
because u0 is 0. Same thing for here. If I have n min as 0, here would be u0 equals to 0. Whatever the case is, this is a table of values that you will get. And imagine this. You put one equation in, you can solve part i, which is the third dose here. You can solve part 2, which is the sixth dose, right? Because seven dose, you overdose already. So this is just the magic of this method, especially when questions don't ask you to find un, the general solution for the drug. But, you know, not every question is very kind. Some questions like this one need you to show that the number of salmon in the lake is written like this. So that means you have to find the general formula and let's just try to solve it out with the new method. All right. So again, you notice that this question involves a geometric progression first. You notice that the salmon increases by 5% and then the population will decrease by 10,000, right? So salmon increases by 5%, that means it's 1.05. The fisherman will fish 10,000 salmon, which means you lose 10,000 salmon. So the interesting part about this method is using this method, you'll solve part two first, and then you can solve part I, part two, part three at one go. So let's just try to find a general formula first. Again, defining our un. You can use f bracket x is up to you. I, I, it's really up to you. Lot. But why we use u subscript n? Because when you have u subscript n, it's usually a integer. So we let un be the number of salmon in the lake at the beginning of the n year after 2014. Now, why beginning of the n year after 2014? Because if you look at part two, that's what they want us to find. Right? They want us to show that the number of salmon in the lake at the beginning of the n year after 2014 may be written as such. So we just start off with un as per usual. So the salmon population of salmon increases by what? 5%. That means we have not 0 0.05, but 1.05. All right, be careful of this. The word increase. So we have 1.05 of the previous term. Afterwards, the fisherman will fish 10,000 salmon. That means we will lose 10,000 salmon, hence minus 10,000. Again, from here, we then skip by, well, already skip, we substitute in un minus 1 to give us 1.05 square, un minus 2 minus 1.05 times 10,000 minus another 10,000. I know I skipped the substitution, I didn't really show it because I want to illustrate the point that if you practice this method enough, you can skip the substitution, you can even skip the next line and then just immediately jump to the final solution. All right, so it's just a three, three, three step thing, and then you get the general formula already, which I will do right here. So ultimately, again, the same logic. 2 plus n minus 2 is n. So I see a 1.05, right? Right side, the number of terms correspond to the power. So it's the same thing. Here's the thing. Where should we expand to? So in the previous method, oh, sorry, in the previous question, we could expand it to u0 or u1 because we have u0 as 0 and u1 as 500. In this case, we know that un is the number of salmon in the lake at the beginning of n year, n year after 2014. We know that at the beginning of 2014, there are 150,000 salmon. So at the beginning of 2014, it's basically zero years after 2014. That means we have u0 equals to 150,000. That means we have to expand it to u0. So if this is zero, and the power plus this number has to equals to n, the power is n. If the power is n, there will be n terms in our geometric progression. So first term, 10,000, bracket 1.05 power n minus 1 over 0 0.05. So over 0 0.05 is basically times 20. So I'll then change it like this. All right, this is how I do math in a faster way. So we then substitute in u0 as 150,000. So it's going to get a bit messy. All right. So if you can do your calculations very fast, you can write this down already. But I will just show it all. So I have 200,000, 1.05 n, and 150,000, 1.05 n. So I have 150,000 minus 100,000. I will get 50,000, 1.05 n. And then I get the part two. Now, unfortunately, your method is for part i. So what can you do? Don't worry, right? All you need to do is, 
You now key in your equation to your GC, and then you get this table of values. So you're interested at the beginning of 2016, which is n equals to 2, so u2, which is right here, 144875. So this is your part I working. Go from GC, code the table of values, and then you're done. For part 2, all you need to do is write these few words down from I, or you can write from the working in I, then write the equation again. UN equals to 50,000 for minus 1.05 power N. All right. Then from here, you saw part I and part two already with just those few steps. Okay, so you have to write the values in. You just write on the recurrence relations, just keep substituting. With enough practice, you can get to the end. All right, then part three, you already have the table of values. So we just change our table settings to N equals to 10, then you put like your, your change in your step, B2, to give you 10, 12, 14, 16. And what you realize is 28 was positive, and then 30 become negative. So what you can do is check whether is n is, well, n equals to 29 negative, or is 30 being the negative first. So one way to do it is, if you use a graphing function, just type in your GC in the calculation page, y1 bracket 29. If not, what you can do is go to your table settings, change your start to 28, change the step to 1, you can then expand to 28, 29, 30, and you notice that 29 would be the least value of n for the population to be depleted, because at n equals 29 is the first time the population goes to negative. All right. So this method only works well, not, sorry, it works for any type of uh, progressions, need not just be a combination, but it's more efficient for a type of question where it combines the geometric change and the arithmetic change, right? If it's just a purely arithmetic progression, there's no point using this method. It's probably uh, longer. If you use, if it's a purely geometric question, then again, there's no point using this method. It is longer, all right? So for a combination of both, you then use this method, all right? And one thing right, you can do with this method is to check your answer. right? Using, again, the sequence uh, function, key in your sequences, your recurrence relations, you then get the same table of values, and that's how you can check your answer. All right? So at this point of time, are there any questions? If you do, then you can type it out on the chat, and I will entertain them either later during the Q&A. If not, I will assume that there's nothing. I will just continue with the next method. Differentiation, the general power rule. And it's not the power rule that you're thinking of, all right? Because if you look at this example here, you want to find a derivative of x to the power of 2x. So the wrong way to do it is basically using the formula of d dx of x power n, all right? So you might think that, oh, I just bring down the power to the front and then reduce the power by 1. This doesn't work for this question, because for this method to work, n is a real number, not a function. But this time when you look at your question here, the power is a function of x. So you can't use that anymore. So what other methods of your differentiation involves power? And the first one that comes to my mind is e, power fx. Or some of you, if you are really being very general, a power fx, all right? But I'll just focus on e because it's the easiest one. Because if you have a power fx, you need to consider, you need to multiply by log a, which is another 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 problem. So I'll just look at e power fx. So is there a way for us to convert x to x to e power fx? Answer is yes. I'll just convert it for you guys first, and then I'll show you guys the proof. So if d dx of x to x, which is the same as d dx of e to the power of 2x ln x, all right? Now, how does this, how does this conversion, conversion work? Very simple. Let me use another color that's easier for you guys to see. All right. So we have a to the power of b, okay? Such that k, k equals to log c a, all right? So if k goes log c a, we know that 
a equals to c power k. So we substitute that back into our original equation. We get c to the power of k whole thing power b, which is the same as c b k. All right, circuit breaker coming soon, so I picked the right letters. So we get c to the power of b times k. You now substitute back in k to give you c b log c a. So this is how the conversion comes about, right? If you want to change your power, you kind of like kick up the base or the, the base. So from x, right, I kick up the x to give me ln x, which is basically the logarithm of the new base. So that is the whole idea of how you convert x to x to e to the power of 2x times ln x. You then apply the exponential formula, which is basically getting back the same function. Oh, uh, I'll just stick to this color. Too lazy to change. Multiply it by the derivative of the power, which is 2x times ln x. And this is where I got the general power root. e2x ln x is the same as x to the power of 2x. I bring back down the ln and then times the derivative of the power. All right. So here's the general, the general power root where we have, uh, find a space here, all right, fx to the power of vx. If you want to find a derivative, it's basically the original function times the derivative of the power multiplied by the ln of the base. Because it's all proven, it's actually derived from your exponential conversion and your exponential derivative rules. But nonetheless, I will then continue from here. So I get x to power 2x times, so differentiating 2x times ln x, how I do it very fast, differentiate 2x to give me 2 times your ln x, plus differentiate 2x to give, sorry, now you differentiate ln x, so you differentiate ln x to give you 1 over x, so times 2x will give me back 2, I get 2 times x to the power of 2x, ln x plus 1. All right, so mainly this is the general power rule for any function of x, which includes vx being a constant. So if you substitute vx as a constant, you realize this rule still stands, okay? So it's kind of a, it's not really a very important rule. All we need to know is the conversion, all right? If you know to convert, you actually think you're going to use this rule, but it's just for your understanding, okay? Pretty simple method, uh, quite, quite useful sometimes, at least helps you with some of the differentiation. And now I'll move on to something more interesting. And before I start, I'm pretty sure that you guys have seen some questions where the volume of revolution is incredibly difficult to solve. Even me, when I look at the H2 questions, I look at some of the volumes and I'm like, how do I solve this with a shell method? And which is why I'm bringing in a shell method for you guys, because sometimes a shell method, you can solve the question in like two minutes, where the question like, let's say the question is like five marks, you solve the question in two minutes, you save like seven minutes in total. And which is the reason why this knowing some of the alternative methods would help you guys with your time management because you're able to solve the paper faster. Okay, I shall now begin with the this method, which is the H2Math method. And I'll explain to you guys in detail because I need you guys to understand how the this method comes about and how the shell method comes about. All right, so we have the classic x square graph where r is the area from y equals to zero to one and the curve itself. So basically the area down here and then you have s being the area between the graph and the x-axis and x equals 0 to 1. So it's a... more people are coming in, okay. It's kind of annoying. All right. so what we do is, very simple, we rotate r about the y-axis completely and we get a disk, right? So this method, you get a disk, that's quite obvious. So how did the disk come about? The idea is that it's like a cucumber, and then you cut it normally, like a normal human being, you cut horizontal disc. So if you have a cucumber that is facing vertically, I mean, you can try, you cut it horizontally to get these small little disc of cucumbers. And that's the disc, what the disc method is all about. So what we're doing is, we get the volume here, you're just taking these discs, just cutting it like this. And hence the disc method. And it's just like integration, we are considering infinite number of disks, right? If you look at area, it's the infinite number of rectangles. In volume for the disk method, it's the infinite number of disks. 
that means you're cutting a lot of disk in the volume, which means one thing, right? How do you find the volume of one disk where we have infinite number of disk? Okay, so the volume for disk is basically the area times the height, right? Area of the circle on top times the height of the disk. So the area is pi i, pi r squared. That's from primary school. Question is, how do you find the radius? If you look at the graph, let's say we look at the top disk right here, you notice that the radius is from here to here. All right, let me use another color. PVT is a bit annoying when it comes to changing color. So I'm using green. So the radius is from here all the way to the graph. And you notice it's from the y-axis and it's horizontal all the way to the curve, which means that it is x. That's why the area is pi x squared for the area on top, the circle. Then the height, which is now the idea of integration. In order to take an infinite number of disks, you are cutting very, very, very tiny disk, right, of delta y. Because you notice that the height is parallel to the y-axis, therefore delta y. Delta being a very small value, almost negligible. That's why for the volume of a disk right here is, is the very familiar pi x squared delta y. And when you add all the disks together, the infinite number of disks together, we basically apply the integration pi x squared delta y. All right. Sorry, eh, not delta y, dy. Okay, so this is how your formula come, uh, came about. Is this, is this whole idea of taking a vertical cone or a cucumber, chopping it horizontally, and then you get these this. Obviously, in math, it's infinite number. In real life, you start chopping your, on, or your hand off after like a while. We apply the same idea for S, rotated about the X axis. We now have the vertical disc, right? Because we're now cutting from the top. So now we actually are shaft, right? Cutting a cucumber in the normal way. Same idea, cutting infinite number of disc. That means the width of each disc is now horizontal, therefore parallel to the X axis, delta X. So the width is delta X. The area, the circular area, you notice the radius is now parallel to the y-axis and it's from the x-axis to the graph itself vertically uh, straight line vertical, it's a vertical straight line and therefore y that means the radius is y so the area here is pi y square as a result your volume of a disk right here is pi y square delta x Add them all the add, them, add all the this together, the infinite number of this to give you pi y square dx. Alright, so these two formulas is basically the this method. And this is how the uh well the formulas come about. The whole idea of this, right? So this is a so on top is the y-axis, below is the x-axis. The problem with this method is what happens if you get these graphs? Right again, classic x square graph, r and s being the same. But now instead of rotating r about the y axis and s about the x axis, I rotate s about the y axis and r about the x axis. Now you can't exactly get your disk anymore, right? Because the interested area you are you want to find or the interested volume you want to find are here, and there is no disk, right? You can't exactly cut one line across, cut one line across, cut one line across, because you get these unwanted areas. So the idea for this question is, if we want to use a shell method, you have to consider a cylinder, basically the rectangle from x equals zero to x equals to one, minus of the region of R. But is there a way for us to calculate the volume directly with just one integral? Answer is yes. And it's the idea of the shell method, right? So how does the shell method work? Let's say you have a cake, right? And instead of cutting, cutting it like a normal person, you will cut rectangular sizes. You are the psychopath that decides to stick the knife through it from the top and make one circular ring inside. And this is basically the idea of the shell method. Taking out the outer layer, or if they insist, shell, and then getting more infinite number of layers, you keep on cutting, 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 peeling off the outer layer, outer layer, outer layer, until there's none left. 
And that is the idea of the shell method. All right. So let's put it on some axis. So let's say we rotate a volume about the y axis. The idea is you take out the outer layer, the outer circular area, which is basically the shell or outer circular strip. And then you just lay it out flat. All right. So you, you take away the outer layer, the outer circular uh, area or the piece, or actually more like a strip, lay it out flat to give a horizontal strip or a rectangular cuboid. Right? And the idea is, again, just like integration, you're taking infinite number of layers, so the widths you take out are very small. Now, if you notice that your width right, is parallel to the x-axis now, hence delta x. And if you notice right here on the strip, your width is delta x, so here will be delta x. Here should write it below. Then, next thing to ask, what's the height? So the height is from the x-axis to the curve itself is vertical line, therefore y. Therefore, we have the height y. All right. Then we are left with the length of the cuboid or the strip. If you notice that the length of the strip is this outside area here, this outer circumference here, right, which will give you the length of the strip. And we know that it's a circle, so the formula for a parameter of a circle is 2 pi r. What is r? So you notice that if you look at the graph here, r is from here to here. So it is x. From here to here is also x. All right. So because it is x, we have 2 pi x as the circumference of the layer, which is also the, the length of the rectangular strip. Therefore, the volume of a strip is 2 pi xy dx. Actually, the infinite number of strips are. All right, very easy to write out just one volume of a strip. So that's the shell method. So this is about the y-axis. All right. Now we look at the volume where we rotate it about the x-axis. Same idea, taking out the outer layer by outer layer infinite number of times. Then we get a vertical strip where we lay it out flat. Again, infinite layers. So here is quite an exaggeration. So, uh, well, it's PowerPoint and my fault, but whatever. So from here to here, you're getting infinite number of strips, right? So there's multiple rings inside. Therefore, now it is parallel to the y-axis, delta y. That means the width is delta y. So from here to here, it is delta y. Again, what is the height? So from here to here. Now, the height, all right, is from, uh, wait, I'm being dumb. Yeah, from here to here. All right, because you're getting the horizontal, the vertical strips, the height is basically from the middle axis, the y axis to the top right here. Therefore, it is y. Wait, no, 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 x, sorry. Horizontal is x. Okay, from here, they're left with the length of the cuboid. And we see the length is again the circumference, which is now 2 pi, and the radius is now y, because from here to here it is y, therefore 2 pi y. So the volume of the revolution using the shell method about the x-axis is given as integral of 2 pi xy dy. Because one strip is 2 pi xy delta y, add them up together, 2 pi xy dy. All right. So you notice that the formula is similar for both axes, 2 pi xy. The difference is in the axis that they're integrating with respect to. All right. So if you look at this two examples again, you notice that for S, we are kind of getting the outer layer, right? Because you notice our strips are like this. And from here, it goes all the way, oh, it goes all the way behind to the front. From here, it goes all the way to here. So this is the outer layer that you are looking at. And this is the idea. Then from here, it comes to here. This is the second, well, quote unquote, second layer, but it's an infinite number. And here, here is the third layer, and so on and so forth, right? Which is the shell method because you're taking the outer layer by outer layer by outer layer by outer layer. So this is the perfect idea for shell method. So you just apply the formula 2 pi xy 
dx, right? If you always, if you cannot remember the formula, just remember here to here is delta x. Okay. Then you know it's an x squared graph, so this is basically integrating x cubed. From here, it's the same idea, right? It's the vertical strips. So you have these strips right here. I'm just going to give a few examples. Then you take from here to here, from here to here. So this will be your first strip. First outer ring from here to here will be your second outer ring. So again, this will be 2 pi x, y. Here is dy. If you can't remember, from here to here, you're taking infinite number of strips. That means very small width, delta y. All right, then this will just simply give you 2 pi integrating y3 over 2 dy. Very efficient, All right? You just want the right integral and you're there. And these integrals are easy because we have y equals to x squared for both graphs. All right, but otherwise, this is the general formula 2 pi xy dy. And here I should write it again 2 pi xy dx. All right, so here is here, here is here. Okay. These are the formulas for both methods. So we have the h2 method on the left, the this method, pi y squared dx, and pi x squared dy for x axis and y axis respectively. For a shell method, both have the same formula, just that they integrate with respect to the opposite axis, right? So if you notice for the this method, rotate about x axis, integrate with respect to x axis, y axis, y axis. For shell method, rotate about the x axis, integrate with respect to y axis. Shell method, rotate about the y axis, you integrate respect to the x-axis, all right? Then here's the most important question. You may know these two methods, but how do you decide which method to use? Very simple. When it comes to volume questions, integration, always go back to the fundamental idea of your integration, which is the Riemann integration of taking rectangular and areas under the curve. So it's the same idea, right? So let's say you have a bounded graph, okay? With something like this, and the interested region is here. Let's say this region here, R. What you do is you draw lines, all right? So you want this region R is from the graph and then to the bottom, to the x-axis. Should we just use another color? Easier to... All right, so let's say you have this, re this region and the blue area basically represents the lines that you need to draw. From here, you see what axis you're rotating about. And then you see whether there is a relationship between the lines and the axis of revolution. All right? And what's the relationship you need to find? I'll tell you in a while. All right? So then let's look at the this method first. Okay? So with the same examples as just now, for x square graph, r rotate about y axis, s will rotate about the x axis. I want r, right, which is basically bounded between the curve and the y axis, so I can draw my lines this way. For S, it will be vertical. Uh, I can't draw vertical lines. All right. Now, if you notice, the this method works when this R rotates about the Y axis. The this method works for S when the S rotates about the X axis. And you notice the lines. They are perpendicular to the axis of revolution. So it's perpendicular, lines are, lines are, oh, I shouldn't use the parallel sign, or was I thinking? So lines are perpendicular to axis of revolution. For the x-axis, you notice, right? The lines are also perpendicular to axis of revolution, which then boils down to one thing. The this method gives you the volume directly when the lines you draw are perpendicular to axis of revolution. So this is the relationship that I'm talking about. Is it perpendicular? Or for the case of the shell method, it is parallel. All right. So you notice for the shell method, if you look at these two regions again, is you're looking at the outer layer, right? So you notice that S is bounded between the curve and the x-axis, and they still give you the same vertical lines. R will still give you the horizontal lines. But this time round, this rotates for the y-axis, and the lines are now parallel. This is the x-axis, and the lines are also parallel. And therefore, the shell method, your lines are parallel. 
to the axis of revolution. And it's actually pretty intuitive, right? If you actually know the how the shell method actually comes about because you're taking the outer shells, right? You have to always taking the outer strip, which is well, like this. Right? This is about the x-axis. You notice that the strip, the height, they are all perpendicular. Oh, sorry, parallel. If you're looking at it at the horizontal way, so on the right here, you notice that this is about the x-axis. The lines here are parallel to the axis of revolution. All right. So this is the main difference between a shell and this method. And you can see them right here. All right. So the this method, the x-axis, the y-axis, the formulas are there, shell method as well, and the instructions on using them. All right. And one thing I need to caution you guys is if you use the this method for, let's say, solving part one, you should only use the this method throughout that part. Don't mix both methods together. So let's say part I, you want to use the, both the this and the shell method. 100%, you're going to go it wrong. And I'm speaking that from personal experience. I tried that twice. I got zero for that question in my further math paper. Okay. The idea is that the, this, the volume by the this method and the volume getting the shell method on the same region may not be the same. And in terms of calculations, it may not be accurate as well. Okay, so if you, let's say part I, you use the this method, use the this method throughout that part. If you use the shell method, use shell method throughout the part. Unless, unless you're asking you to calculate two different volumes at the same time for the one part, then you, are, you can mix both methods, right? But if you're solving for one particular region, use one method only. Okay, so let me give you some, some a few examples here. So this is another classic quadratic graph with basically two minus x squared. Now, again, draw the lines, right? So you want this region here, so this region inside. I can draw vertical lines from the graph to the x-axis. I can also draw horizontal lines from the y-axis to the graph. So you notice that both methods only and fully encompass the region, which is why for this graph, you can use both methods for both axes. So you can use shell for both x and y axis. You can use this method for both x and y axis as well. All right, because let's say you rotate this region about the y axis, the green lines are parallel, the blue lines are perpendicular. If you rotate this graph about the x axis, you have the blue lines being parallel, you have the green lines being perpendicular. So both method works. All right. However, if you look at this graph here, a classic y equals to ex graph. Let's say I have the re region here as r, and then this upper region as s. You notice that r is only, you can only draw vertical lines. And for s, you can only draw horizontal lines. That means for s, if you have to think about the y-axis, the lines are perpendicular, so disk method. If you're thinking about the x-axis, the lines are not parallel, so shell method. For R, if you're rotating about the y-axis, shell method, because your lines are parallel. X-axis, your lines are perpendicular, so disk. Right? You can imagine, you can just imagine the entire volume and then cutting out the disk or the shell, if you know the method well. All right? So this is one way to do it. This method because it's perpendicular. Shell method because the lines are parallel. All right. So another example which I got from a Discord user. So let's say you're interested in this region here. All right. So now again, think of it as okay. This region is rotated about the x-axis, right? So rotated about x-axis. So if we had to use the H two method, which I until now, I, I, I mean, I didn't bother solving because this looks way too tedious with the this method. And the reason why, if you notice here, if you think about it as a form of an area, you're interested in the region inside. If you look at the region, it's basically taking this graph here, the x squared graph, minusing the area be uh, between the y-axis and the root x graph, so this area here, right, because the root one actually is a darker color. Hmm. So the x-ray graph is the blue, is the purple lines or blue lines. 
then the root x graph is the red lines here. So you just take the volume of x squared minus away the volume by root x because the area of the inside is the area between y and x squared minus away the area between y and root x. Same thing applies to volume. That's why we have that uh, uh, relationship. And what you notice for the lines is that they are now parallel to the x-axis. So because they are parallel to the x-axis, this is the shell method. So we then have 2 pi x, y, so d, y. Right? So for the x square, you must know that you are integrating with respect to y, so you need to change x to something. So we're minusing the graph from x square to root x. So y equals to x square is basically, well, x equals to root y. I know it's plus minus root y, but if you look at the graph here, x is positive. So it is the positive square root. We have y equals to root x, just square both sides. We have x equals to y square. Okay, so the volume is simply 2 pi y power 3 over 2 dy minus away 2 pi y cube dy because it's xy, right? So xy will be y cube. Here xy will be y3 power 2. Then the limits 1 to 2, 1 to 2. You can combine both integrals together because they're the same uh, limits and the same multiplier. But I'll just leave it as here. All right. If you look at the integration here, it's way easier, right? It's just your normal general power. All right. So this is one application of your volume of revolution for the shell method. If you want to use this method, have fun with getting four marks out of this, right? Imagine you use a shell method, one step, boom, you're done. Two. Again, the summary page here. All right. And if you're wondering, my YouTube channel that has videos on the shell method, the this method, and the recurrence relations. So if you want to uh, so well, watch me talk about the methods more in depth, you can head over there and watch those videos as well. All right. So on the last chapter for today is complex numbers. And it's the idea of roots of unity. So what is roots of unity? I'll start with a very simple introduction. So we are used to seeing the exponential form as z equals to rei theta, where r is the magnitude. Theta is the argument, basically the angle from the x-axis and measured anti-clockwise, the positive x-axis region measured anti-clockwise to the uh, complex number. Now, usually we represent, we, we represent it this way, but if you want to represent it in a more generic way, you have to add plus 2k pi to your angle with the idea that Every time you add 2 pi, you are basically revolving the complex number 2 pi around the argon diagram, one round, one complete revolution, which means that every time you take 2 pi, you just make one big round back to the same point. If you add it, if you add even more 2 pi, then you just keep getting back to the same point, which is why we don't write the plus 2k pi because it is quite, uh, you know, meaningless, right? Because it's, it's implied. But this is also the tricky part. Right, because it's implied, people tend to forget some stuff, right? Which I'll show you later. So when we take the power n, so we have z equals r i theta, we now have z power n, which means we apply the power n on both sides to give us r to the power of n, and then you apply the power n, which is basically just times your theta with n and your 2k pi with n. So we then get r n, r to the power of n, e i bracket n theta plus 2k n pi. Again, we now have 2 pi and we rotate it kn times, which is basically rotating the same point 2k times, uh, kn times around the argon diagram and ending at the same point. Therefore, we have rn, r to the power of n, ei, and theta, which is the reason why if your z equals to r ei theta, you can just immediately write down z n equals to r power n, ei, and theta without the 2kn pi. All right. Now, here's the thing. You now have z n, z to the power of n equals to r ei theta. What some you might do is, hey, just apply power 1 over n on both sides. You get one equation. You get one solution. The problem is, it goes back to the original idea that a polynomial of degree n, basically highest power n, must have n roots of factors. All right. Now, this includes repeated roots of factors and non-root and non-root factors. All right. So that I know what you're thinking. So I know x minus 1 square 
equals to zero, there's only one unique root. There are two roots, right? But they are repeated, okay? So in any case, any polynomial of degree n must have n roots or factors. Same thing applies to our complex number, right? If you notice, we only have one root here, but our polynomial, our degree here is n. Our highest power is n, and we should have n roots. Problem is, unless n equals to one, we don't have enough roots. So what should we do? And the idea is that we go back to the idea of the general solution that we implied. So we need to add 2k pi theta, all right? So before we take the root. So we add 2k pi theta, we then have z equals to r to the power of 1 over n, ei theta plus 2k pi over n, where k is an integer, all right? Let me just write that down in case some of you guys aren't too sure. So right, k is an element of the integers, and n is a, well, actually any real number, but you don't really need to know that. So for now, we just to get n is an integer because that is what is going to be applicable for the HTML syllabus. So this is the idea that you need to add 2k pi before you take the root. And I can guarantee you, the idea is that you still get z distinct roots from here you'll definitely get z, uh, or n distinct roots for z, okay? Why? Well, an example later, but this is the idea of roots of unity. z to the power of n equals to r i theta. Basically, you have z equals to r to the power of 1 over n, ei theta plus 2k pi over n, such that theta plus 2k pi over n still follows the restrictions in our argument between minus pi not inclusive and inclusive of pi. All right, and in a complex number, it's very different from a polynomial where you might have repeated roots. In the complex number, you definitely have n distinctive z solutions. All right. So I'll show you an example. So we have z squared equals to 2 ei pi over 3. We then have z equals to basically apply the power half. Right. So but before that, I have z squared 2 ei pi over 3 plus 2k pi. That means now I can then apply the power of half to give me root 2 ei pi over 3 divided by 2, which is pi over 6, plus 2k pi divided by 2 is k pi. All right, and this is the general solution. Now we need to find the exact solution with the consideration of the limits in our argument. So we know that k is any integer, so we just need to substitute in some integers and see whether the angle exceeds pi or goes below minus pi. So obviously, we put k equals 0 first to give us root 2 ei pi over 6. Don't forget, 0 is an integer. Okay. Now, we then examine, can we use 1 or can we use, or should we, do we need to use any other number? So we realize that if you use k equals to 1, we get 7 pi over 6. Pi over 6 plus pi is 7 pi over 6. So this exceeds our limit for our argument. Therefore, k equals to 1 is not allowed. As such, k equals to 2 is not allowed. Anything above 1 is over the limit. So we don't need 1. We will consider 0, so that's that. But we also can consider the negative integers of k. So we try k equals to minus 1. We realize we get minus 5 pi over 6. So that is within our argument, the limit of our argument. That's why we have root 2 ei pi Sorry, minus 5 pi over 6. All right. And you notice these are actually pretty nice complex numbers, right? Because the angle is pi over 6, which means you can use our special angle. So we just have root 2. Then cosine pi over 6 is root 3 over 2 plus sine pi. So we have i. So sine pi over 6 is half. So we have half i. Okay, let me just write that down properly. Then on the right, you notice that minus 5 pi over 6 is basically the third quadrant, which means it is negative for both the cosine and the sine values. So it's simply negative root 2, root 3 over 2 plus half i. All right, so pretty quick method. And why this actually applies to h 2 math 
is because of these types of questions where they want you to find the square root of a complex number. And you know that we've experienced that there should be two solutions. All right. Now, the usual way is the algebraic method. We let this, we let a root be a plus b i. You then get your equations, right? You square both sides, get the simultaneous equations. From here, two ways to go about it. One is you make root you, from equation number two, you make a or b the subject, then you solve it back to one, and then you solve a quartic equation, power four equation. Another way, which is my preferred way, I square both equations to give me bracket a squared minus b squared whole thing squared and for a squared b squared. I add these two equations together, I get a squared plus b squared whole thing squared. Why? Because here is a squared, sorry, uh, here is a power 4 minus 2a squared b squared plus b squared. a squared plus b squared whole thing squared is a power 4 minus 2a squared b squared. Okay, I, I keep forgetting my powers. All right, a power four plus two a square b square plus b power four. And if you notice, these two differs differ by four a square b square. Then what? From here, you just simply get the third equation, and then you solve, getting plus minus three over root two and plus minus root three over two or root three over root two. A pretty long method. If you are confident in this method, I you should go for it. In fact, I recommend you to stick with this method because there are some restrictions to the method, to the alternative method that I'm showing you. But for now, we put that aside first and let's apply the new method. So we know that we have root 3 plus 3 root 3i. And we let z be this. That means z squared equals to 3 plus 3 root 3i. And what you notice about 3 plus 3 root 3i is basically, first thing first, calculate the argument of this complex number. So the argument is given as tangent inverse y over x, right? Where y is the imaginary part and x is the real part. So we have 3 over root 3, sorry, 3 root 3 over 3. Then we get root 3, right? Sorry, a tangent inverse root 3. So we know that tangent inverse root 3 is pi over 3. All right, that means I can rewrite this this complex number into ei pi over 3. Now, we are missing the modulus. So the modulus we know is basically the square root sum of squares. You basically, 3 square plus 3 root 3 whole thing square, then you take the square root. That's why it's called the square root sum of squares. Yeah. So this is the square root, then the summation of the two squares, which is 9 plus 27, so it's 36 and we get back 6. So this is 6 ei pi over 3. So what we do now is we solve for z by applying the power half. But before that, we add the 2k pi. So I'm going to do that all in my head. We get i pi over 6 plus k pi. And then you notice it's the same complex number as the previous example with the different modulus. So we get root 6 ei pi over 6. So k goes to 1 root 6 ei minus 5 pi over 6. Now we solve for one side because you notice that the, they share a basic angle of pi over 6. So root 6, so cosine pi over 6 is root 3 over 2. Then sine pi over 6 is half. Then over here, you simply get root 6. Actually, you don't have to solve for here because if you can solve for the one on the left, you'll get the answer on the right. So because you know that cosine will have the negative value in minus 5 pi over 6, and sine will also have the negative value in minus 5 pi over 6. So you then solve from here, you get root 18 over 2 plus root 6 over 2. And in fact, this answer is accepted because there's nothing else you can do. Obviously, you can change root 18 to 3 root 2 because you can do root 9 times 2. So root 9 is 3, so you get 3 root 2. And on the left, you simply have the negative value, 3 root 2 over 2 because of the argument minus, how am I doing? Minus root 6 over 2i. All right, then over here, you can just copy down the same thing. So we get root 6 minus root 6 root 3 over 2 plus half i. Okay, so you notice you get the same answer. It's actually not much difference from the previous slide. It's just that I never took out the certs. For the previous slide, is I never rationalized the denominator. Okay, so this is the 
root of unity, roots of unity method for our solving of square roots of a complex number. And the reason why I want you guys to still be fluent on the algebraic method, the 100% method, is because that this method, this roots of unity method, is not used for every question or theta. Why? And it should only be used, used in the following cases. Theta equals to plus minus pi over 3, theta equals to plus minus 2 pi over 3, and theta equals to plus minus pi over 2. Why is that so? If you think about it, when you're taking the square root right of a complex number, the argument, so let's say the argument of z square is theta, the argument of z equals to half theta. So in order to do this question, you want your half theta to be either pi over 4, pi over 6, or pi over 3, your special angles. Otherwise, you will need to do more steps, right? You cannot just simply key in the argument in your calculator because some of them are like, I don't know, root 7 or something. So you, you never know. And if half theta equals to these angles, that's why we can only have pi over 2, pi over 3, or 2 pi over 3 as our original theta. Otherwise, it's very awkward. Like if you try, right, let's say, finding the square root of uh, 1 over root 2, so let's say 2 plus 2i, then good luck to you because even you can kind of express this as uh, 4 plus 4, 8, so root 8 ei pi over 4 plus 2k pi, then you take the power half, you notice you'll get 8 to the power 1 quarter, e, wait, this not, yeah, 8 to the power 1 quarter, ei pi over 8, which is awkward, then k pi, you like, you want to find cosine pi over 8 and sine pi over 8, right? Uh, you need to involve like a lot of like trigonometry identities. You can just simply key in your calculator cosine pi over 8 and sine pi over 8 because they are not exactly special angles. All right. So again, roots of unity only used for special angles after you apply the square root. And this is basically if you do your reverse engineering, only these three cases are allowed. All right. So these are the four chapters. Oh, that was pretty insane. <laughs> yeah, 